Okay, good morning or good afternoon, depending on your time zone. Welcome to the NAI Director Seminar. Uh, before we get started, I wanted to say a couple of things. One is, uh, please check out the new Integrated Astrobiology Program website. The website was a labor of love by a number of people here at NAI Central and working with folks at NASA headquarters. And uh, it, we've been getting a lot of good feedback on it. We'd love to hear more feedback from you all. The URL is astrobiology.nasa.gov. And the NAI website URL has not changed. It's still nai.nasa.gov, and it's been integrated into the large overall website. So do check it out. And there's uh, uh, windows at the bottom of each page that enable you to provide us feedback. And so please do provide us feedback. Uh, compliments, criticisms, corrections, anything are all welcome. One other thing I wanted to mention is that the cover story in the April issue of Scientific American is by one of our own researchers, Nancy Kang, from the uh, Virtual Planetary Laboratory, University of Washington team. She is at the Goddard Institute for Space Studies in New York, and the topic of the cover article is the shocking colors of alien plants. And Nancy and uh, colleagues on Vicky's team have been working on understanding what photosynthesis might be like if it developed under a different stellar spectrum than the spectrum of the sun. So check that out as well, and she also has papers that have been published in uh, astrobiology, and the references are given in there. So, let me now take a minute to introduce our speakers. Our speakers today, as you know, are Jody Deming and Jim Staley of the University of Washington. Jody actually began her career with NASA at the Goddard Space Flight Center some time ago, and then got her PhD at the University of Maryland. What she has been interested in is, for her entire career, are the extremes of life, one of the things that she did was early in her career to isolate a novel pressure requiring bacterium, uh, which she then named for her research advisor, Rita Colwell, and named it uh, Colwellia. And today, Jody's students are using one of these as a model organism for cold, adap for, uh, cold adapted microbes. Her research has taken a turn towards psychrophiles and looking at low temperature life, particularly stimulated by the potential for there to be such life on Mars and Europa. So today she does a lot of work in the high Arctic, and uh, we're going to be hearing about some of that today. Our other speaker is Jim Staley, and Jody, incidentally, is a professor of oceanography. Jim is a professor of microbiology, of course, both at the University of Washington. Jim's major research area is microbial diversity, and so he studies microbial ecology, evolution, taxonomy, and applies it to both bacteria and archaea. He's particularly interested in the genomics of unusual bacteria, and these include sea ice bacteria, as well as bacteria that are involved in nitrogen cycling in the suboxic zone of the Black Sea. And the Black Sea work is particularly interesting because the whole redox gradient in the Black Sea, which is anoxic, uh, at its lower level, serves as an analog both for the early Earth conditions as well as the possible redox and metabolic gradients that might exist on other worlds that are anoxic, like Mars and Europa. So uh, he is also working on psychrophilic organisms that are trapped in sea ice, and we're going to be hearing today from Jody and from Jim about how their studies of life at low temperature on Earth might apply to Mars and Europa. And I will now turn it over to Jody and Jim. Thank you, Carl, for that nice introduction. Uh, Jim and I are both pleased to be able to address this audience on a topic that we think is pretty relevant. Am I on screen with this? Yep. Because, after all, it is cold out there. I have been spending a lot of time recently in the high Arctic, as Carl alluded to, uh, in the wintertime in particular, to get the coldest ice formations possible. But that hasn't always been the case. Ten years ago, in 1998, I thought it was a pretty big deal to have organized, helped organize an international project to be working in open waters of the Arctic. 
And there we were doing traditional oceanography, collecting water samples. And as my graduate student likes to say, this is not the um, night sky of the Arctic, but rather the concentration of bacteria in a tiny drop of seawater displayed for you on a black background and visualized with a stain specific to DNA. So we're talking about a million bacteria in a milliliter of seawater. And these smaller dots are the viruses that are known to attack these bacteria at 10 times the concentrations of the bacteria. So I want you to keep this in mind when we go to freezing this seawater. While I was at sea for this expedition, I was totally mesmerized by all the ice formations. Here we have a glacier pouring off of Ellesmere Island, the sea ice cover itself, lots of structure and some of the older ice formations. And when I got off this ship and came home in July of 1998, the big news was all Europa and these images, these fantastic images were everywhere that we all know so well now. This one in particular uh, was very motivating for me because it resembles, although on a different scale, the sorts of ice features and iceberg breakups that we see in the Arctic on our planet. So uh, this did cause me to take a turn in my professional life, and I joined forces with the UW Astrobiology program that started that year with my self-appointed role of studying life in cold ice. And then I proceeded to learn that Europa isn't the only place where there might be another ocean in the solar system. I was behind in my astronomy. Mars, though it doesn't have one today, very likely had one in the past. And now we have all the excitement about Enceladus, which I just saw these images in 2006, but last week we have all this new excitement of eruptions of water with organic material in this water. So there's a lot of ex exciting stuff going on in our solar system, and, and the question may be, uh, is there any life associated with the ice that we might be able to sample at some point in our students' future? Here is um, a depiction of following the water on Earth. Following the water is what we're instructed to do in astrobiology. And the blue line here is where we find liquid water on Earth. Here's the 0 to 100 degree range for distilled water. But you can keep that water liquid by virtue of hydrostatic pressure all the way up to some very severe high temperatures at deep sea hydrothermal vents below zero you keep it liquid by uh, its content of salt and other impurities. So I'm after learning more about what happens in this zone here, this temperature realm here, which brings relevance to the Martian surface and subsurface. Um, here's the European surface, but the European ocean tells us there must be a temperature gradient. So I want to push these boundaries as much as possible and see what we know about life in very cold ice. I'm, in fact, then following the ice in order to follow the water, and I'm doing so in the north, in, in part because I think the uh, original astrobiologists lived there. Um, we might think of ice as frozen water, but the native Inuit think of water as melted ice. And in fact, ice is the natural state of water in our solar system. So I think they knew something before we did. It's, it's also a perspective to bring in how you study ice. Up until recently, microbiologists, to study what was in ice, would melt the ice, return it to its liquid water state, which completely changes the environment, the habitat they were occupying. So my aim is to study the microbes in the unaltered ice. The North also gives us the possibility to study different types of ice formations. I've circled the Arctic sea ice, but we also have freshwater glacial ice on Greenland. And we have the permafrost, uh, Siberian and Alaskan Canadian permafrost, which is frozen soil. If we look at average global tabulations of these types of bodies of ice on Earth, at any one time, about 20% of the, of the surface of our planet is covered with one form of ice or another. It's the glacial ice sheets that win the prize for the greatest volume of ice. But if we're following the water, they have the smallest fraction of liquid water in them. And this is because they have the least impurities to depress that freezing point. So if we really want to follow the water, sea ice wins the prize there. And its particular aspect is that you can get very cold temperatures and still have a considerable uh, fraction of that's liquid in the ice. The eutectic point or the freezing point for salt water is minus 55. 
which is again the average temperature of the surface of Mars. Permafrost is also has a special interest. Uh, it has the, it ranks second with seasonal snow uh, for the amount of water, but it also brings us closer to geologic age because some of these permafrosts are quite old. And one feature in permafrost that's understudied as an astrobiological uh, habitat analog are cryopegs or lenses of briny liquid that are buried deeply in permafrost. They might make nice analogs for future studies. If we now look at the total number of microbes that are in these different ice formations, so this is just number of bacteria. Remember that picture I showed you before. Freshwater ice has the lowest numbers. And note that there's not a single sterile piece of ice that we know about. They all contain some number of bacteria, 200 to 1,000 in freshwater ice. On the other end of the spectrum, we have permafrost with over 10 to the eighth bacteria per gram of that material. And that isn't really a surprise to microbiologists because it's soil that's frozen, and soils contain 10 to the ninth per, per gram typically, so this is not a surprise. In between, numerically, are saltwater forms of ice, up to a million per mil, as we saw before. And the difference here is that in most cases, these organisms are active. They're doing something, and it's because they are not restricted in terms of the amount of water available to them or nutrients. The other uh, interesting thing you can observe in this table is that if you're talking about particle poor ice, you have lower numbers of bacteria. As soon as you introduce particles, mineral grains, organic detritus, any sort of attachment surface to ice, your numbers zoom up. We have plenty of examples on this planet of ice formations that are rich with mineral rains. So this is sea ice laden with sediment somewhere between permafrost and very clean ice. Well, my first uh, trips to the Arctic in the dead of winter was in March of 2001, north of Barrow. The temperature there was minus 40 at the time. And this was work done with an NSF Life in Extreme Environments Award to meet into Hayo Eichen, who is a sea ice geophysicist at the University of Fairbanks. We went out on the RV sled, the research vessel sled, very sophisticated Inuit device here, which works perfectly to take you over the cold ice. Our aim was to core into the ice. We had a little power generator because it's like drilling cement. To get a temperature gradient here, the coldest temperature we got was minus 20 degrees because the snow overlying insulates. And some of you may have heard of uh, work by my graduate student, Karen Yunga, that came from this project. So here is a sea ice core pulled out of there and lying on its side. Here's the interface with the ocean. So here's the warmest temperature. And the darkness here is a visualization of all the microbes that live in it, the sea ice microbial community, which Jim will talk about a little bit further. I'm after, again, the coldest ice near the atmosphere, the snow atmosphere interface. There's kind of a rule of thumb in sea ice that once the temperature drops below minus 5 degrees, the ice becomes impermeable. Uh, it's mechanically strong, and we think that little can uh, squeeze out of it, if you will. And if you haven't really thought about freshwater versus sea ice, uh, here's a little kitchen demonstration that you can do for your own family and students, if you like. This is a freshwater ice cube made from tap water. And this is an ice cube made from seawater with some blue stain dribbled over it. The stain just washes off the freshwater ice. It is not porous. The sea ice is highly porous and soaks up the stain immediately. That porosity is where the liquid phase is, and that's the, the source of the habitat. Now, this is very warm ice, uh, so there's a lot of porosity here. Uh, but we're talking, we want to get to the point of talking about very cold ice, so let me do that more formally here for you. This is a panel of artificially created sea ice, 30 millimeter square panel <coughs> being shown here. The white is where H2O has moved into the solid phase, and the black is the brine liquid phase that remains. So you can see that the pores in there are quite sizable. Just drop the temperature at a degree, and everything begins to narrow up. The pores decrease in size. Overall porosity decreases. Take it to winter temperatures, and boy, you've moved all the H2O pretty much into the solid phase. And conventional thinking at this time was that the pores were all closed up, as I said, an impermeable ice mass. 
bad news for microbial life. Maybe you can be preserved in here, but not much is going to happen as long as you are squished into uh, impermeable zones here. The problem with this, or, or let me also say that the, you can see the brine concentrating factor here because as this closes up, as I said, drops below minus five, the salt and the other impurities have no place to go, so they get concentrated into these small pore spaces. And it's not just the salt, but we've learned that it's also the microbes. Well, the problem here is that we're at the millimeter scale, and a bacterium is on the order of one micrometer in size. So we're way out of, out of sync here in terms of size for examining a habitat for a microbe. We wanted to get to the micrometer scale. So we set up a laboratory, a freezer laboratory, with a factory modified epifluorescence microscope with computer image analysis next to it and a, t a graduate student willing to spend her life in that freezer. And she developed a way to take a slice of natural sea ice from the, from the winter carefully cut it across the top to expose the, to open up some of the pores, with these are exaggerated pore spaces. She had to de develop a DACI stain or a DNA specific stain so that when you dropped it on there, it wouldn't immediately freeze, but instead would diffuse into the brine pores. So it had to be isothermal, isohaline. That took a while. But once we figured out how to do that, then we could peer into the ice without having melted it to see what kind of a habitat that was like. The first image that I'll show you is um, unstained, just transmit, transmission light to look directly into the ice and what can we see at the scale of micrometers. This was a very exciting image when we first saw it. This is the solid phase of ice and these are the brine pores, 50 micrometer scale here. What you're seeing, what, what I want you to see, is that these pores are not isolated. They are all connected. It's an interconnected system on the scale of the microbe. And since this ice, it's sea ice on our planet anyway, has a temperature gradient across it, there is, uh, there's the possibility for convection and advection of fluids through this matrix, through this network. So this is good news for life. Now this is also an unstained panel, and what you're seeing are two pairs of diatoms, sea ice algae, that have been trapped in the ice. And they are not frozen into the solid part of the ice. They are excluded into the liquid phase. This is the brine phase. And they're fluorescing green, not because of a stain, but because their chloroplasts are naturally autofluorescent. And they're very healthy looking. There's no cell damage that's visible. They're not doing anything in the winter in the Arctic because there's no sunlight, but uh, they appear undamaged. We have to go to the epifluorescent light and the DNA stain to see the bacteria. But they are plentiful and concentrated in these liquid phases. Using another stain, a postdoc with me at the time, Christopher Krems, he discovered that these sea ice algae were coating themselves with what we call EPS, extracellular polysaccharide substances or exopolymers. These are basically sugars, that take the form of gelatinous material or literally mucus. And it turns out that the ice pores of, uh, sea ice pores, the liquid phase is filled with this mucus material. This is unstained, even unstained, you can see the mottled appearance of what's in there, the gelatinous material. So the cells are coating themselves up to survive the winter. Well, Christopher did some very detailed analyses of artificially created uh, sea ice with and without these exopolymers. And without the exopolymers in a completely abiotic system, you get these Euclidean pores that appear to be disconnected. With EPS, produced by life, you've now got a completely altered habitat with fractal dimensions to the pore spaces, greater surface area to colonize in interiorly, the ice holds more salt, it stays holds more liquid at lower temperatures. It's a remarkable example of microbes altering the physics of their environment to enhance its habitability. Well, what about the bacteria? And here's a panel from the coldest ice we had at that time. You're seeing three ice crystals together, a triple point juncture, and we blow up a little pore in here, and voila, there, there's bacteria in there. And this is my favorite slide, at minus 15 degrees, we captured a bacterium in the act. 
Um, we can't really prove that, but as you focused up and down on that, you could see the break point in the cell here as if it's about to divide. Which raises the question of what are these organisms doing in there? Okay, they've altered the habitat to make it more habitable, but are they able to do anything in there? And in the interest of time, I won't explain the methodology here, but I'm happy to later. Um, what you're seeing here are sections of the ice from near the ocean to the atmosphere. So the coldest section is here. And 100% of the cells that were active were attached to something. To make a long story short, the bacteria were, are also embedded in EPS, in this exopolymer material. It's not just the sea ice algae. All the microbes in there are embedded in this material that is facilitating their ability to metabolize. And we think it's because the, these gels are highly hydrated. So they're providing greater water around the cell even while there's this serious brine just a few micrometers away from them. Since that project, we've not been satisfied with just being able to get a single ice core or a set of ice cores from one trip. So we've been overwintering in the Arctic. We've had two of these remarkable expeditions, uh, which are under the guise of Canadian leadership, especially during the international polar year. And we froze in in the north and got to work with our astrobiology friends up there. And as we're asking the question, is this sea ice that we're standing on, that the ship is immobilized in, that you can land a plane on, is this a museum for all the microbes in there, or is there something going on that we need to know about? So here is a, a contour map that shows you temperature. Uh, cool colors are for cold, warm colors for warm. The sea ice grows at the bottom into the ocean, if you haven't thought about that before. Uh, so you can see the ice growth during the course of the winter. We sampled uh, periodically throughout the winter three different ice horizons to look at the microbes that were trapped in there. When we started, when we got there, it was already pretty cold for them. And we got some colder temperatures here. Again, in the interest of time, I'm just going to summarize what we found from that first overwintering expedition. Uh, graduate student thesis work here. We found that in, in the case of both bacteria and archaea, which we confirmed are really present in sea ice, they persist in numbers and diversity throughout the winter. There's no die-off of one group or another. They're persisting. And we can see that the exopolymeric content of that ice increases during the course of the winter. So we obviously think those two things are connected. There, this is a mechanism for surviving the winter. But then my other student lead, um, was fascinated by these viruses that were present at high concentrations. We already knew they were present at high concentrations in summer ice, but we didn't know for winter ice. And here they are at very high concentrations. What that means is that the viruses and bacteria have been brought together for some super high contact rates in these brine pores, 600 times the rate at which they'd encounter each other in normal seawater. So this is a dynamite situation for an interaction between a bacterium and a virus if you can view that positively. And Lee did some short-term experiments at the coldest conditions uh, we could get stably on the ship, minus 12 degrees, 16% salt. And he was able to show that bacterial and viral numbers are not static, they're changing. Bacteria are growing, dying, being hit by viruses. Viruses are increasing, dropping. It's a very dynamic situation. So when we're not at sea, we're working with Coelia, our model organism that Carl alluded to. It holds a number of records. Its growth record is uh, Jim's bug got to it first. He'll tell you about that one, but they both grow at minus 12, swims at minus 10, produces enzymes, produces these excessive exopolymers as you move into frozen temperatures. So we're going from seawater into ice here and zoom. It overproduces EPS. What we're pursuing now with this model system, we're pursuing the physics of how ice grows. This is an abiotic situation here with lamellae, they're called, of ice growing. Let me show you real sea ice growing. This is a scale of one millimeter. My newest graduate student is working on this. We're after understanding how these growing physical lamellae actually trap organics and microbes, how that process works. And we're um, working 
further with the virus that Lee uh, obtained that attacks Coelia <coughs> and does so at a record low of minus 12 degrees and 16% salt. So we have a model system of this microbe with its attacking virus. So that presents the potential in the, in the microbiology community being able to have what's called a genetic system where you can uh, move genes about if we can get this to work out. And that's what we're ultimately interested in is the concept of lateral gene transfer. Usually we think of inheriting genes by reproducing. You inherit genes from your parents, from, from the daughter cells from the parents. But lateral gene transfer is a case where a bacterium being attacked by viruses, here's a close-up showing the virus actually injecting some DNA into the cell. That DNA normally, normally, would take over the bacterial host and reproduce hundreds of viruses, kill the host, and that's the way viruses reproduce themselves. But sometimes the virus moves into the cell and joins the bacterial genome and lives benignly with it, generation after generation. And in the process, it can bring in a new gene that it picked up by mistake when it was killing another bacterium. It's a different way of evolving, and it has the potential of a more rapid way of evolving. We have some clues from the genome sequence of Coelia. Not only that the genome sequence told us what we already knew, which is that it likes to release a lot of stuff, um, but it also tells us potential for lateral gene transfer. There's a gene that's involved in archaeal methanogenesis in our bug. I mean, our bug doesn't, uh, it's a bacterium that likes organics, so it's not a methanogen. And we have two viruses, whole genomes of viruses that are sitting in here benignly. So we think we're on to something, and I want to leave you with the idea that these poor spaces in very cold ices, especially saline ices, are not museums, but some very exciting things may be going on in there that uh, touch upon the evolution of life at very cold temperatures. And we'd like to make some more progress on this concept of lateral gene transfer as a very potent mechanism for adapting to a, an extreme environment. Do I have just a couple minutes for pretty pictures from our last overwintering expedition? We just got off the ship, uh, I guess, a month or so ago. So we don't have a lot of results yet. But most Westerners are not up in the Arctic when the ice begins to freeze to witness this scene of frost flowers. So this is where the ice on the ocean is just beginning to freeze. And instead of all of the brine rejecting downwards into the ocean as, as the, when, the water, when the ice is still warm, some of it ejects upwards. And the atmosphere is now getting cold, so it freezes. And you have frost flowers. So this is a field of frost flowers not studied before by microbiologists, studied by the physicists for issues of convection of brine. Well, guess what's in those frost flowers? Again, this is not the night scene there, but the, but the many millions of viruses that are in those uh, frost flowers being ejected into the atmosphere. Now, that's something to think about. And at this point, I'll transfer the torch, or the ice, as the case may be, to Jim. Jody, thanks a lot, and Carl, also thank you for inviting us to do this. This is uh, a uh, big adventure for us. Let's uh, uh, get you. See if I can get. Maybe I need to be hooked up here to another presentation. But um, what I'm going to try to do is to talk to you about um, the search for low temperature growth. And uh, we don't get there immediately, but we'll get there. <laughs> and um, so it's a search for low temperature growth. I want to say a few words here about the discovery and significance of marine gas vacuolate bacteria, which seems perhaps somewhat bizarre to you, but it's related here, I think, to our topic. I'm actually going to skip this second topic because of time limitations. Then I want to talk, uh, most importantly, about the low temperature growth and then finish it up with the uh, genomics of uh, an extreme cyclophile. So our work began in the Antarctic. We weren't looking for low temperature growth at all. We were looking for bacteria that degraded chitin. And we were working off the Antarctic Peninsula, which is the peninsula 
just south of uh, South America there. And uh, we were taking water column samples, and we came across some uh, bacteria that were growing in the water that had gas vacuoles. And the way we told this was that you can see on the lower left plate here colonies that are quite uh, chalky white in appearance. In contrast, organisms over here of the same species uh, are not that way. And the difference is that these organisms have gas vacuoles inside of them. And so you can sort of tell just by looking at the colony type whether or not they have these gas vacuoles. And then when you look at them under the microscope, you can see these bright areas inside the cells which are indicative of gas uh, vacuoles. Um, the real proof of whether they have gas vacuoles is to look in the electron microscope. And you can see these, uh, it doesn't show up too well, but these little vesicles are the subunits of the gas vacuole. When these are isolated, they look like this. They're cylindrical and they have conical tips on them and they consist of a protein. It's just a single protein uh, that forms this membrane around the, uh, the gas vesicle. And that protein is hydrophobic. So in the cell cytoplasm, water cannot get into the vesicle, but gases, whatever the gas is in the environment, freely diffuses into the vesicle. The result is these little vesicles are hollow spots in the cell they allow the organism to rise or to fall in a gradient. Um, ecologically, they're important then in buoyancy or motion. These are uh, enabling or organisms to rise, I said, or to fall, depending upon how many they need to produce to be at the location they wish to be. And this is a simple organelle of motility. It's made with a 7,500 molecular weight protein, very small protein, and it's a repeating subunit that forms the, the membrane. Because of the simplicity of this structure, I argued that these are likely an early, evolutionarily speaking, organelle of prokaryotic motility, very simple to form. Some of you may be aware of the creationist argument about the bacterial flagellum, which is, of course, the organelle of motility most people know about being so complex it must have been designed by intelligent design. Well, here's a very simple structure that uh, could be designed by unintelligent design or what we call evolution. <laughs> uh, anyway, seeing that these organisms were in the water here made us think that since they are organelles of motility that allow you to rise or fall in a gradient, that perhaps they're associated with the sea ice microbial community, which is a stratified community. And uh, this is the evidence that we had from that cruise looking at uh, depth samples that were taken in samples in which were positive over here for the gas vacuolate organisms were all collected in the upper zone of the marine habitat, 10 meters, a few at 25 meters, but absolutely none of them at 100, 200, and 500 meters. This suggests that these were floating the bacteria up toward the surface uh, of the water. Now at the time we had our hypothesis, we were at the Palmer station, there was no sea ice left. So what we proposed to NSF was to go the next year to McMurdo to actually look in the sea ice microbial community to see whether or not these gas vacuolate bacteria were there. So we sampled off McMurdo station, there's a nice uh, a bunch of sea ice over here, it's actually uh, used to land airplanes on part of the year. It's two meters thick, typically, uh, and of course, as the season progresses, the summer season, this will eventually melt off, and they closely monitor this to make sure the planes are all right. These are C-130s on it. We collected samples uh, near the airstrip here, this McMurdo Station here, some samples here, but also we went across the Sound, McMurdo Sound, and collected some samples over there as well. And uh, Jody's already sort of explained this, and of course I got a polar bear in there, just to keep you guys alert. We're going to go to the Arctic, but we're not there yet. <laughs> anyway, the sea ice community is sort of at the interface here between the water, and, and it's in the ice, but at that interface. And this just shows a, a cord sample, which has the black, or not black, but the dark uh, amount of uh, sea ice microbial community in it, uh, due to the diatoms primarily. But, uh, are the primary producers. 
And then this shows a, a completely extruded and full length uh, sea ice column with the sea ice community at the bottom as Jody has shown also. And so we sampled in that sea ice community at different depths. And what we found were a lot of colonies that were like this. And you can see they're pigmented colonies. Many of the sea ice bacteria are pigmented. But they have a sort of a white fringe around the colonies. And this is the chalkiness of gas vesicles. And we verified these things were gas vesicles. And we went ahead and surveyed. And sure enough, you, we did find the gas vesicle bacteria in the sea ice. So in this particular sample at site 4, 83% of the bacteria in this sample, which was in the ice, 20 centimeters above the uh, uh, sea ice interface. Um, so there were a lot of them there, not so many at most other sites, but the point was they are in the ice and they are associated with that uh, radiant of the ice. And I'm going to skip this part because it's not so relevant to us, except I wanted to uh, point out we did go then to the North Polar area and we sampled off Point Barrel. There are several sites here, and the site I want to talk about mostly is site number two, which was in the Elson Lagoon. And this is a different sort of habitat from the open marine habitat because as a lagoon, there's a little more evaporation and concentration of salt. So it's a sort of higher salt uh, environment than the typical sea ice environment. And uh, I don't want to talk about this now. So the question is, are these sea ice bacteria good psychrophiles? We weren't set out initially to answer this question, but it became of interest to us as we went along. And so you might just ask yourself, well, what would be the features of a psychrophile um, that's living, uh, that you want to believe is a very good psychrophile? One would be, of course, its ability to grow at zero degrees or below. Another possibility would that it be uh, have a low GC ratio, uh, and this relates to the DNA. The GC bond is a triple hydrogen bond. The AT bond, in contrast, is a double hydrogen bond. So if you think about replication, it might be better to have double hydrogen bonds rather than triple hydrogen bonds to break. Uh, so maybe a low GC organism is good. Ours is a 40% GC organism, uh, so that's pretty low and GC content. By the way, this argument does not apply to thermophilic bacteria. We know this. You can have low GC organisms. You might expect that in the case of thermophiles that they would have more GC than AT. And that's not always the case. So, but I think uh, evidence so far for the low temperature thing may indicate that this is true. We're not sure yet. Another thing is a habitat. As Jody's mentioned, the coldest temperatures at the air uh, interface with the ice. So the farther up, up the uh, ice column toward the surface is where you'd expect maybe to find your uh, low temperature organisms. You'd also like an organism, and that's by the way where we did find it. We found it in the upper uh, 50 centimeters of a 180 centimeter ice core near the surface uh, of the, uh, toward the air. Also a toleration of freezing point depressants in a medium. Salt, our bug grows at 12% salt. I think Jody's does at least that as well. And, and glycerol. We find that this organism that we're growing can grow in glycerol. It utilizes glycerol as a carbon source. That's a freezing point depressant. It'll grow in the presence of 5% glycerol. The other thing is that we would hope an organism would have a low maximum temperature for growth. And I'll explain that in just a second. Uh, here is the ice column that we uh, got these organisms out of. Uh, this is a very different ice column. The dark areas in this uh, ice column um, are not sea ice microbial community. They are sediment. <laughs> so in Elson Lagoon, you have the phenomenon of anchor ice formation. The ice freezes on the bottom, and then it floats up and carries sediment with it. And then that gets entrapped in the ice column. So it's a little bit different environment. And our bug was isolated near the surface here in this sediment uh, area there. Um, so I wanted to say a little bit here about growth rate of bacteria versus temperature. We have E. coli that you're all quite familiar with. Its high temperature for growth is 44 degrees. Its low temperature for growth is 8 degrees. So that span is about 35, 36 degrees 
uh, in temperature, and that's typical for bacteria. The hyperthermophiles, they can grow as high as 121 and down in the upper 80s as their minimum growth temperature. And in the case of our bug, uh, it has a low maximum temperature for growth. It grows at 10 degrees and not higher. So if you sort of superimpose a growth uh, situation on this organism, you'd expect that it could grow perhaps as low uh, temperatures at minus, minus 20 or so. We don't know that that's the case, but we have shown growth at minus 12 degrees. So um, the problem with the, the minus 20 thing is a technical problem. It's difficult to provide conditions where you have liquid water available in an experiment in the laboratory. But um, that's something that I think can be uh, addressed in the future. Here are the bacteria, and unlike uh, what you might expect from something from a cold environment, these are quite large bacteria, they're about a micrometer in diameter, and they're 10 to, uh, I think about 16 or 17 micrometers in length. That's a big, big bacteria. And they have gas vacuoles in them, uh, which are the bright areas that you see here. And I don't think this shows up very well, I didn't think it would have been, but you actually have uh, two types of gas vesicles here. This is an electron micrograph showing the cell. Uh, and there is a larger gas vesicle that you can see somewhat. And I'm afraid the smaller one, uh, because of the layer and such, it doesn't show. But there's one very thin, long vesicle type. So it forms two different types of gas vesicles. And we think that this may be important, perhaps in the brine pocket, somewhere along the way they have a reason for producing these two different types. This organism actually also produces a flagellum but we've never seen yet uh, in our, uh, we've never seen flagellar motility in our cultures. And so this is your organism in the upper uh, cluster here is the Cyphromonas group. Our, our bug is Cyphromonas ingrahamii. Um, and uh, I want to point out here that uh, we've done some comparison with the genome work with closely related organisms, the Idiomarina lohiensis from Hawaii and also with the Cowellia group, Cowellia psychorythria. Uh, please note that Jody's organism is closely related to that. <laughs> um, and then some other organisms as well with the genome work. And this is a growth curve here. Um, the organism grows uh, at minus 12, as we've said. Now, the way we did this was to make a medium up with the glycerol, and I think the salinity was that of green water and um, we set up 25 pre-cooled tubes, and we inoculated these tubes and um, incubated them in a very uh, a good incubator, one of these hocks that keeps the temperature at minus 12. We have a maximum minimum thermometer in there to make sure that it never got higher than the minus 12. And then we incubated these for weeks. Uh, it's a very long-term experiment for bacterial growth. And within the first week, about six or seven of the tubes froze. Um, this is not made necessarily unexpected, but this is the sort of thing you encounter. Um, and interestingly enough, after that, none of the tubes froze. And the organisms were continuing to grow. So we think the EPS that these bacteria produce may have something to do with lowering the freezing point, uh, point of, the, of the water. But we're not uh, positive about that yet. We can easily test it, though. Uh, so anyway, this is a growth curve we got. The generation time here was 240 hours or 10 days for generation time. So it's pretty slow growing, um, but it is growing nonetheless. So here are the features of the genome here. Um, first of all, I think what's interesting, uh, perhaps maybe the most interesting thing, is that the cell membrane proteins are not as hydrophobic as typical cell membrane proteins of bacteria. They're more hydrophilic. And this would give the bacterium uh, more fluidity in the cell membrane. And this is uh, what, what normally happens is the, it's thought that the cell membrane sort of freezes up or rigidifies, and then you lose your ability to, uh, to grow uh, and transport nutrients and so forth. And we found six different classes of proteins here. A typical bacterium has four classes. There's one bacterium that has five classes, and that's also a psychrophile, called Pseudultramonas haloplanctus. 
Well, this organism has actually six classes of proteins, so it's quite unusual in that regard. And this is based upon uh, correspondence analysis. One of these classes has many unique orphan genes that may be related to low temperature growth. And we don't know what these are, are doing, but again, express and raised would be very interesting to try uh, to, to see what is uh, perhaps going on here, which ones are expressed under low temperatures. There's another interesting feature here, and, and that is that these organisms have quite a bit of asparagine. Uh, this is amino acid that they have in their proteins. Now, asparagine is interesting in that at higher temperatures, it breaks down to aspartic acid. So you don't see so much in mesophiles and certainly thermophiles, but in this cyclophile, you see a lot of it. And there's less of things like methionine, the cysteine, and histidine, and these are sensitive to oxygen. And at low temperatures, of course, the environment is going to have a lot more oxygen in it. Um, so we think these things may be important. Whoops. To the um, wait. I seem to be missing one here. There we go. Uh, so th this is the correspondence analysis plotting against the most informative axes that they found. One is the asparagine concentration, and you can see they have generally quite a bit of asparagine. There are the six different classes of protein illustrated here. Um, aromaticity, uh, they don't have so many aromatic amino acids in them. <clears throat> and hydrophobicity, they have a low hydrophobicity in the, in the proteins. So we think these are probably important aspects of low temperature growth. This is just the amino acid composition of total proteins. And I want to just point out here is the asparagine here. You can see it's quite a bit higher than you have in E. coli, Schuonella onidensis, and Vibrio cholera. So there's something going on here at low temperature that's consistent with that. Uh, also is that it has less of the methionine here compared to these other bacteria, uh, less of the histidine, and less of the uh, arginine. And there are other features I'm not going to point out here, but the proteins are somewhat different in terms of their amino acid composition. So uh, to summarize, uh, we have a large number of cyclic GDP regulators um, that um, are uh, important in EPS production. Uh, there are also chaperones and stress proteins that we think are very important in, in terms of low temperature growth, refolding proteins so that they're more able to uh, work at lower temperatures. There's also uh, betaine-choline, and betaine-choline is an osmolite. As the um, salt concentrations in brine pockets increases, this osmolite would be produced by the cell, inside the cell, to counterbalance the external osmotic uh, pressure from the uh, salt. And then it has these two different gas uh, vesicle proteins inside the genome as well. Curiously, the most closely related organism to this is, is not uh, these others that were in the same group uh, on the basis of proteins, it's Vibrio cholera. Now, Vibrio cholera is um, not only a pathogen, but it's in a different family, and it's in fact in a different order of the bacteria. So this was really quite a surprise to us. But uh, in looking at the types of proteins that are similar, it turns out it's basic core metabolism proteins, things that give the organism energy. Um, they have a glycolytic system, which they share in common. They have the TCA cycle, for example. They carry out fermentation. So these genes are the ones that are shared uh, with these, uh, with the Vibrio cholera. And then these are the other organisms uh, here that we've showed, shown. And psycho, uh, psychorythrine here is, is not as similar as Schuonella. Yes, it's, it's kind of fascinating. There are these differences uh, on this. Comparison with other bacteria, so the Vibrio cholera thing, as I mentioned, it's surprising. Uh, we don't think it's a horizontal gene transfer. Julie talked about lateral gene transfer. Horizontal gene transfer is the same thing, a different word for it, <laughs> where you're getting transfer, perhaps, of the 16S gene into an unrelated group, namely the 
It's like we want to screw. We don't think that that's the case because it's just these core metabolic genes. We think it is. They share an evolutionary history with Vibrio, but that's an ancient history and it has to do with metabolism. Um, they also, uh, we've been comparing with Cycloerythrae. Uh, is minus 12, the 19 degree bug. Idiomarina is not really a psychrophile, uh, but this was another organism that just comparison. As I said, it was quite closely related, but it grows from 4 degrees to 46 degrees uh, at somewhat higher growth temperatures. Nonetheless, they share many proteins in common, these close relatives, and these proteins are probably the most important ones for low temperature growth. They include things involved with RNA uh, and DNA uh, uh, synthesis and so uh, DNA polymerase is one, for example, RNA helicases and so forth. So we think these are the types of enzymes that are really important for um, cyclophilic bacterial growth. Um, summary here, the yes, aspectable bac bacteria are indigenous to the sea ice community. Uh, sea ice bacteria are su superb cyclophiles. Cyclomonas ingrahamia grows at minus 12 or lower. Genomic features that are of interest, unusual membrane fluidity, six classes of protein, very high asparagine concentrations, production of EPS, and the two types of gas vesicles that they have. So I will leave it at that. And, uh, well, I should mention, I wanted to especially mention not only graduate students and, and so forth from the lab, but Monica Riley, she was the, the power behind the genome sequence, and I have to give her special credit here because I've talked a lot about that work. Okay, I guess, Jody, are we ready for questions or <laughs> what's the procedure at this point? Well, the first uh, thing is for all of us to thank our speakers very much. Yeah, the uh, process here is for folks with questions out there to raise their hands on WebEx is the preferred way, although folks can also jump in. Uh, while you're raising your hands on WebEx, let me just put in a plug for the next director seminar, which is four weeks from today by Steve Benner. Uh, so I hope you'll all tune in then. And maybe I'll uh, take the chair's prerogative here to ask a question, which may actually be more appropriately directed to somebody in the audience, because it's not so much directly on, on what you talked about, but on the application of what you've talked about, particularly to Europa. And Jody, I'm thinking of uh, your discussion of the microphysics of the ice, and I'm just wondering if anybody has done modeling uh, that you know of, of the frozen ice above the European Ocean, to understand at the bottom of that ice, where the ice and the ocean are in contact, what kind of thickness of ice might have the kind of microstructure with interconnected brine pores that you find in the sea ice that you're looking at, and uh, just you know, how might that microphysics be reproduced at the bottom of a European ice layer? Well, I don't think anybody's done that modeling work yet. I think they're still debating how thick the ice cover is, if there is a an ocean, what its salinity is. But there's plenty of modeling work that's been done with regards to Earth sea ice, and we know that temperature and the salt concentration of the source liquid control the final product of the ice and its interconnectivity of pore space. So if we knew the salinity of a European ocean, and if we knew the temperature gradient, then we have ways to immediately calculate and model where you could expect to find enough liquid porosity to support microbes. Well, if there are some European modelers out there, I hope you take that as something of a challenge from Jody and uh, try to take a crack at that. So, uh, let's see, do we have any hands raised, Marco? There are no hands raised yet in WebEx, so let me encourage you to do so if you can. Otherwise, if somebody has a question out there or a comment, please just jump in at this point. This is Jean oh, This is Jean Brenchley at Penn State. And can you hear me? Yes, we sure can. Go, go ahead, Jean. Apparently you couldn't see us. <laughs> anyway, I wanted to ask Jim Staley. Towards the end of his talk, he was mentioning protein similarities with other organisms. And unfortunately, we got disconnected. But I was trying to figure out, did you mean that it was phylogenetically related by RNA to Vibrio cholerae? 
or were those just protein homologies that were related? Yeah, it was protein homologies. It was surprising because it's not so closely related on the basis of 16S phylogeny, and that's sort of the disparity there. How does one explain it? But I, I would argue that since we're talking about core metabolic genes uh, being in common between Vibrio and Saccharomonas syncrahamii, that that's what they share. And those genes, one wouldn't expect to necessarily be involved in this sort of peripheral activity that has to do with psychrophilic. So I think the 16S is actually true here. I don't think it's a 16S transfer that's happening. That would be my, argu my argument. Okay. That makes sense? <laughs> <laughs> yes, thank you very much. I think somebody else was also trying to break in perhaps just about the same time as Gene, so if uh, you were, please go ahead. Yeah. Vicki Meadows, I think, yeah. <laughs> it was Vicki off screen at UW. Um, ah. I, wanted to ask, I wanted to ask Jim actually about, um, you talk about the buoyancy control for these microbes. Does anybody know or has anybody speculated as to why they might need this buoyancy control? Are they trying to get to optimum temperatures or insulation? Or it's why? a very good question, uh, and I didn't have time to tell you, but these gas factors are found on all sorts of bacteria, especially freshwater bacteria. So the cyanobacteria have them. They want to be up to the top where the, all the light is coming in for photosynthesis. But you also have photosynthetic bacteria that are anoxygenic photosynthetic bacteria that grow in the anaerobic zone of these very same lakes where the cyanobacteria are. So they're strat stratified beneath that. There are even some methanogens that produce gas factors in the archaea, the same structure. And they would be found in the sediments or near to the sediments in, in lakes. So more or less, depending upon the need of the organism, any habitat that has a vertical gradient like this could have gas factors. So a place like Europa, that would be a simple organelle motility that might have evolved early on and could be there yet. So does, does that answer your question? Yeah. Right, we have a question from Ames. Oh, hi, Carl. This is Orlando Santos over in 239, and I had a question that was similar to yours um, about the physical structure of the ice that contains microbes. And what I'm thinking about that is using it as a biosignature. So I'm, I'm wondering if anybody's looked to see how that structure changes, like, for example, say, the con electrical conductivity of the ice or the conductivity of the ice to radar, for example. And if that could be used to look to see if that structure exists on Europa. And then kind of a related question is, how does that structure develop under different gravity conditions? Has anybody looked to see if, you, if, if for example, <laughs> hypergravity conditions affects that structure? Well, those are excellent questions. Uh, <laughs> as far as I know, only proposals have been written to do that sort of work. No work has gone forward with that. Uh, it, keep in mind that it's fairly new information that exopolymers alter the physics of ice. So we're, like I said, we've written a couple of proposals with no success yet, but we'd love to look at the concept of altered physics of ice as a biosignature. I think the problem is going to be one of scale. We can al already recognize on a small scale that you, you could detect these differences, uh, both visually and by the mechanical strength of the ice. The more porous and liquid filled it is, the less strong it is. But to detect a biosignature remotely with a spacecraft, you're talking about a different scale of evaluating the ice with lots of different <laughs> issues to deal with. So. I think that's a big challenge. I think conceptually, we've got a biosignature, but to translate that into one that we can use in the search for life, that's, that's a tough challenge. Okay, we have a question from Montana State. Montana State? Montana, I think your microphone is muted. <laughs> well, while we're waiting for Montana State to unmute their microphone, uh, <laughs> I'd, I'd love to hear more discussion of uh, this 
potential for using the microstructure of ice as a biosignature, that really was striking. I thought this discussion that you just had with Orlando uh, was, was very much to the point. Uh, are there, well, what, what, what do you think is the next step? You spoke about writing proposals, and without asking you to, to reveal what you're writing, uh, what do you think are the next steps in developing you, that Carl. as a biosignature? Excuse me, I overspoke you just at the end. What was your final question? Well, what, what do you think are the next steps in developing the ability to use the microstructure alterations that you're seeing in ICE as a result of the EPS, uh, the next steps in developing the ability to use that as a biosignature? Well, perhaps a next baby step, if you will, would be to advance to a different scale from, we, we've gone from the millimeter down to the micrometer and back up to the millimeter scale. Let's get to the meter scale, which we could test in our Arctic develop some instrumentation that would look down on Arctic sea ice and look, f and I don't know what the sensor would be that would have to be worked out. Um, the proposal I'm thinking of was not my own. Um, so I, I certainly won't elaborate further on it. Uh, but there should be ways to take the next step forward on the meter scale, see what different types of ice we can detect remotely at a distance of several meters. Um, and you could even begin in the laboratory with that process and, and eventually take it to the field. Great, thank you. Montana State, do you have uh, a question? They do on, uh, on the chat. Ah. <laughs> Is there a potential to isolate ancient organisms from these brine channels in an analogous fashion to what has been observed in salt crystals? Um, so sea ice itself, the oldest sea ice that we used to have was 10 years. Because of climate change today, we're losing that ice and we're losing the multi-year ice so that our chances of even getting one or two year old ice is, is slim. But that certainly is not ancient. Our best shot, I think, for getting ancient microbes analogous to the salt work that was mentioned is to work in permafrost. And the deeper in permafrost, the older that material is. And uh, that's why I showed you that quick slide of cryopegs, these lenses of liquid salt that are buried deeply in permafrost. They are beginning to be of a geologic age. Um, the Russians have reported ages of up to 3 million years. Uh, the ones that the cryopegs we have access to in Alaska, for example, are more on the order of 1 to 200,000 years. But that's getting us there. But the difference will be that microbes in those cryopegs, they're in a liquid uh, habitat bathed by all sorts of interesting things, and I don't expect them to be preserved there, but rather actively evolving. Uh, so that's a slightly different question, and in my mind, a pretty exciting one. Um, Ames, your hand is still raised. Do you have any more questions? Oh, sorry. We must must have left it up. Okay. Further questions from anyone? You can just jump in. <laughs> this is Jean Brunchley again, since you're giving me a chance to jump. Go First, for it, I Jean. Appreciate, <laughs> I appreciated both of the talks by Jody and Jim. I did have one other thought for Jim. He mentioned that he thought one uh, aspect of a psychrophile would be that it would have low GC content in the DNA. And I can understand your reasoning and thinking in terms of replication, but wouldn't there be so many replication proteins and things to help replication that maybe the GC content would be not that important? You're quite likely right on that, Gene. I mean, this is just sort of thrown out as I hypothesis at this point. And I, quite frankly, haven't looked at the GC ratios of all these cyprophiles, so and that's something that probably ought to be done. Um, but yeah, you, you may be right that that's a minor component. Uh, we mentioned the DNA polymerase as being a specially you know, uh, uh, evolved type that was found in other cyprophiles, so it may be more the enzymes and the GC ratio that are important. I, I don't really know. Good, good point. 
Gene, if you or any of your colleagues who study cipher files as well have any other questions or comments you want to make, please go right ahead and do so. Well, I appreciate that. I think they've been putting me on the spot to ask the questions here. <laughs> <laughs> they've okay. been feeding me the information. <laughs> or anyone else who has a question for Jim or Jody? Okay, in that case, let's thank our speakers again. you all to uh, tune in again four weeks from now when Steve Benner will be talking with us about a theory of life. So it should be interesting. Okay. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Yes, thank you.